Welcome to MCH 2022, the Abacus stage, and I'm very happy to introduce Breno de Winter, uh, talking about open cat uh, security through cat's eyes. So take it away, Breno. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, um, you are going to see a lot of cat, cat pictures in this presentation. So be alert and be aware. Uh, if you hate cats, bad luck for you. Um, I'm Brenno de Winter, I'm the Harbour Master and at the Ministry of um, Health, Welfare and Sports, I'm the uh, Chief Security Privacy Operation for the Corona Tech. We talked about it yesterday, just a quick reminder, this is my cat Brani. Brani, Banani is how I uh, cuddle her. And that was the name of a project, so we started the website. Then people said, like, that's kind of stupid. This is uh, Hero, Brani, and Keiko. In a government system, it looks like this. Then somebody said, like, stop using cat names. Then the minister said, you can use cat names. So this is what we are going to talk about today. And with the Corona Tech, there are a few projects that we have to do. Contact tracing, a contact tracing app, the Brani Banani I talked about, the, the EU DCC, the QR codes. Um, we built a um, EHR for hospitals in six weeks' times. We have exception routes. Um, we do fraud protection, red teaming, and we are also supporting the other nations in our kingdom, Curaçao, Aruba, and St. Martin. So that's a lot to deal with. And then um, what do we need to do? Of course, the continuous monitoring. And you have all the occasional issues, the shortage of people, the high stress level, especially the political environment that you're in, and then all the tasks you have to do, starting with pen tests and code reviews, ending with your risk assessments, and your weekly starting at 7 uh, p.m. on a Saturday uh, did, uh, DDoS. It's those standard things you have to deal with all the time. And with a small group of people doing that, that is kind of a hard thing. Now, I've been in security for over 30 years, and uh, over 40 years, uh, nearly 40. And um, one of the things I've learned from the thousands of incidents I saw is whenever sh sh shit hits the van, a um, configuration management database is totally different from reality. On the left-hand side, you see Amsterdam in 1538. And that is generally the map when you end up at an incident that they give you. This is Amsterdam in reality. So. Yeah, and, and for my colleague Cleo, sorry, but uh, this is the harsh reality. So this needs to change, and this is a, an issue for us as well. And then what we are doing to prevent incidents is fi basically finding the famous needle in a haystack. And as I've shown you, we've got all sorts of projects going on and different nations to support. So basically, I'm searching in more haystacks than basically would fit on a PowerPoint slide. So far, so good. Then there came this day when we had this corona testing facility that was hacked by the Dutch news out, uh, outlet, RTL News. And basically what they found was a Google Firebase that was in development mode. And yeah, then you can go through all the data. And Parliament said um, to the minister, you have to um, investigate all these parties. Yeah, but it's not our job. Yes, you have to. So we started continuous monitoring, and that was for up to 70 companies at the same time. There isn't a single security company that will say like, oh, sure, we'll help you with this one. Um, because it's highly political sensitive. It's all open. So there we were. So we did a lot of manual scanning in a weekend, found hundreds of vulnerabilities at these, uh, at these facilities. And then the next question came, okay, now we've sent the information over. 
how do we know for sure that it was all fixed? And then you start scanning again. And then this company will go like, no, 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 there was nothing wrong. It's a false positive. Of, or it wasn't really a problem. And then we found other stuff as well. For instance, one of these um, facilities basically said like, okay, we've got secure mail um, for healthcare applications. We let them be part of our system. And then somebody by accident discovered that they turned that off because you have to buy a subscription of a couple of euros per month. That apparently was too expensive. How do you monitor that altogether? So, there were a lot of issues, and it's not even that simple because there's one other issue as well. It's not only about security, it's also about what makes us as team, but also the minister, vulnerable. And that might also be security issues that aren't there. So we stopped talking about security, and we started to talk about everything that makes you vulnerable. That really doesn't scale down the problem. So we decided to go for a tool. And um, since we're talking about vulnerabilities, the Dutch word is kwetsbaarheden, and we want to analyze them. And it's a tool, so we call it the kwetsbaarheden anal uh, analyse tool. And for behold, that's the Dutch word cat. For the ones that were in my lecture yesterday, um, this is the, our team logo. That is perfectly fine for the tool as well. So we learned a couple of lessons. And one of the things that we should do is prove that if we found something, that this is really true. And if something changes, I want to be alerted. And I don't know what can change, but if anything changes, I want to be alerted. And then we found that there were basically no tools that really understood the Dutch context properly let alone the medical context. So long story short, um, we needed something that um, would be able to scan, would be able to do other stuff, but um, also doesn't violate the Dutch laws. Or one could say, I was looking for an eierleg in the Wollmichsau. So how do I realize this? Help. So I phoned my friend Jan Klopper and said like, Jan, help! And Jan is a hacker. Oh. <laughs> I have, I know, I have aged a bit. Yes, it's true. Um, so yeah, we had a problem and, and Benno decided on calling me. I don't know why, but you know, these things happen. Well, I picked you because you were allergic to cats. This is true, yes. Uh, but you didn't know that back then. Yeah, and the first thing you say, said was, um, Breno, stop throwing data away. Yeah. So what we see in the general availability of security tools is that you start scanning, and the end product is always you know, the vulnerability that you find. The end product is always this report saying, you have to fix this, you have to fix that. Um, but to get there, you're probably going to you know, do a lot of queries, uh, collect a lot of information, and all of these tools next to each other do that again and again every time they you know, do a DNS query, do a you know, connection to the server, collect some information, parse it in their own way, make their own answers, put the answer in the report, and you get only the answer in the report. And we decided to do it a bit differently and say, OK, each one of these little steps should be should be a little program by itself, the Unix philosophy. And every time we do uh, one of these little loops, we're going to collect the information, both raw, so we can actually prove that we did it, and we're going to collect whatever comes out of it in the database, in but a how graph do we, database. How do we prove it? Good question. Um, so we decided on running all the tools in containers. Very fancy, but it, you know, it, it's not a means to an end in it. It's actually something that helps us. And we run the container, for example, Nmap, very simple tool. We run it. We collect the information that goes into the container, the IP address. We collect um, the version, the hash of the image. And we collect whatever comes out of it. And that gives a pretty good, pretty good complete answer of what the tool did. 
and then we allow someone else, an external party, to sign that package, hash it, sign it, timestamp it, so we actually prove what we did. So basically the external timestamp service makes sure it's forensically sound. Correct, and then we do that for every step along the way while collecting information to build this graph. Yeah, and this graph we built um, uh, in a cross-time database so that we can see the status of an object in all moments in time. So I can compare an object on January 1st around midnight to the status of the object right now. Yeah, so we have the graph, and the graph that we have today might be slightly different than the graph that we had yesterday. And that allows us to obviously see the differences. Um, but since we have this database of information, we have all the little nodes of information, we can use that graph to then, and only then, um, start looking for patterns, start looking for objects, start looking for things that we don't like in our graph, in our reality, um, within our set of business rules. So if you, if you put everything in objects, you put needles with needles and hay with hay. Yep. So if you say, I'm looking for a needle, then basically you can say, hey, here's a batch of needles. Here's your bunch of needles, yes. OK. The question is, how do we get the data? And we get uh, data with Boofjes. You're, you're going to learn a little bit of Dutch as well. Boofje is the Dutch word of Rascal. And basically, it's a plugin. Yeah, so we have a bunch of different plugins. And Boofjes is the first one. And it's the one that goes out and gets data. Um, it goes on the internet, or it goes, you know, look at the, uh, various tools or APIs, um, or maybe in internal or external databases. And it only, you know, it has a question. It goes and fetches the raw data. Doesn't really matter which format it is in, and it collects it to be stored in our forensic database. And are th they are just facts. Because so, in a regular tool, for example, if you run Nmap. Um, and a lot of tools will immediately say, oh, you got port 22 open. Don't do that. I don't care about port, you know, it's fine. Do whatever you want. I get that a pen tester, you know, probably has a reason not to do port 22 on the internet, but that's a business rule. And the business yeah. rule comes later. Because we made a distinction between facts and conclusions. I have got this guy walking around, Alon Kneteman, and he's basically always doing a finding and then saying like, okay, you have to decide if it's Im important for you or not. So he says like, okay, Breno, I'm looking at your house. I see smoke coming out of the roof and flames. If this is important to you, the logic step would be to dial 112 and ask for the fire brigade. Optionally. 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 You know, yeah. I don't, I don't I know him, what your By the way, I call him my chief conspiracy officer. Um, we have a whole bunch of um, plugins already. We need a lot more. So um, I do the shout out now. Come to your open cat uh, tent and join, uh, join the scene. Um, but then I've got data. And data is still something that is unstructured. Yep. So by now, we've ran all these boofjes, and we collected all this raw information, probably just command line outputs or JSON blobs from somewhere. And in that data is a lot of extra information. Um, we need to process that to actually you know, make sense of make needles. And what we do is we have a separate set of plugins, normalizers or whiskers, as we call them. And we, you know, we couple each whisker either to a boofje or to a mime type and say, oh, Let's see. We have text HTML forensic proof. What can we do with that? We have Nmap output. What can we do with that? And we scan that data um, from the store, check it. And if we find something that we understand, then we add it to the database. Yeah, but, but Jan, today I understand only so much. Mm -hmm. And then all these people are going to help, and then I understand I a know. lot more. Yes, I know. That's very interesting. So imagine having this you know, vault of data that you collected over many, many years, over systems that you, you know, have in production. Um, and and you, know, you had done this as you would, because uh, Breno asked you to. And it's a good morning. You wake up, and you notice there's something wrong with your website. CPUs are spiking every time a browser visits it. And you find um, a bit of JavaScript code in there, and it's 
Bitcoin mining. So it's essentially destroying the planet. Um, you find that bit of Bitcoin code, the crypto miner, and, and you notice that you, you know, obviously missed it because you didn't know it was there. What you can do from that point on is you know, collect that information. You write a normalizer that looks for this specific bit of JavaScript, add it to cut, to open cut, and it will um, probably find another few of these you know, injected bits of HTML or JavaScript in your various sites. Because um, we had already downloaded all the HTML. We had already you know, collected the proof. So you can immediately start fixing these things. But you also have all the historic information in your forensic store. So now the normalizer can start working backwards over all that, uh, over all that collected data and you know, pinpoint the moment in time, because you know, we have a cross-time database, um, where, you know, where we saw that bit of JavaScript for the first time. And this obviously helps with pinpointing you know, when you were attacked. Um, and by having that you know, specific moment, you can probably also dumb it down and you know, look at other log files to see how the hell they came in. Because you know, seeing a bit of JavaScript in your website is one thing. Knowing how they got in is probably a you know, very expensive yeah. research. Yeah. <laughs> a bit of expensive research, yeah. Yeah, and then we store all the data in bytes. Is that one of my cats? Definitely not. It's Simon's. <laughs> uh, Simon's Simon here. <laughs> um, but we store it forensically in our data store. And then, basically, we go for the business rules. Yeah, so business rules. Very enterprise -y name, I know. Um, business rules are more or less like complex CSS queries. And you have a set of data, you have a tree of information. And what a business rule actually does, um, we have one on screen here, it says, OK, every time an IP address is added to the graph, I'd like to be ran. So it's more or less a state machine. And it does collect some other additional IP information, so IP port and websites might be related to this IP address. And then we do some Python magic, uh, run over some crates on websites. We collect some ports. And you know, if we have all the ports at this IP address, and we can do this bit of logic saying, OK, um, if port 80 is open, or port 443 is open, or not, you know, then there's probably something wrong. If so, we'll add a finding, we'll yield a finding to the database. And what this does is it creates a new object in the graph. So if A exists, B must also exist. But A or B or C, you know, this might be more complex queries. We try to keep them simple. And that opens up, for instance, one possibility is that you say, like, OK, yesterday you had five ports open. Today it's 12. Maybe your firewall configuration is no longer good. Yep, but there's more. Um, if I see that you're running a bit of software, for example, WordPress, um, I can do you know, a, a query over all software instances. I can see that you're running WordPress. If this is WordPress, then there must also exist these other 1,568 dependencies. It's deduction. It's very simple. It's a simple business rule. And the business rule feeds on external information, and it you know it handles every bit of WordPress in your site or whatever you want. Yeah, you can there, write was these a, yourself. there was this nice example of the this this Corona test suite. They were using WordPress, and a new uh, common vulnerability exposure uh, came out, and that basically um, gave a CVSS score of 9.8, which is kind of serious. So after they uh, after we downloaded it. Um, I phoned the director of that uh, testing suite, and within 10 minutes of getting the alert, the website was fixed. I can't prove that we prevented a hack, but likely it, it, we did. Yeah, so the business rule was triggered again when we renewed the list of CVEs. And the second that happened, we added all the extra facts to the database. Yeah, there's only one thing. You know, the boofs get the data. The bytes feed them to their whiskers. The octopus, uh, the octopus is what we call the, uh, uh, the system that basically um, does all, all, all the handling of the data. And then ultimately, it ends up with bits. And bits is basically, uh, uh, sorry, we rerun the bits. And then basically, you can do your reporting, etc. We've got obviously got the inf interface for that. Um, 
One so of the interesting... There, yeah, no, I'm not happy. Oh, yeah, go yeah. ahead. One of the interesting things about these bits is that, like I said, they add data and objects back into the graph. They don't have to be findings, but you know they could be. And once you alter the graph, you can then you know, have another set of bits looking at that data again and say, oh, wait a minute. If you have that little technical issue, then you're not compliant with, for example, internet.nl. And if you're not compliant with internet.nl, we've added a finding for this saying, oh, you're not compliant with this. Then we can add you know, another business rule saying, oh, if you're not compliant with internet.nl, you're not compliant with um, NTA. 7516, which is safe email for the healthcare. Yeah. So you can you build these really big compliance questions and you know strip them down into smaller technical questions, simple queries. Yeah, there's only one thing that I'm totally not happy about, and that is um, so far I have to do everything myself. Start it, click it. So we've got a scheduler. Yep. Mula, another cat of one of the developers. Mula is our scheduler, and we're now kind of in, you know, in the volume of search engines. Um, so we have lots of objects, and every object that we add to the graph either triggers a bit or business rule, but they can also um, be input for another set of buffies. If we find a host name, it doesn't matter where we collected it from, then we can probably do a bunch of things, like, you know, uh, DNS queries. We can try and see if there's any subdomains. We can look for certificates via transparency um, records. So deciding on which boofies to run and in what you know in what what order um, is something that the scheduler does. Also deciding on when to rescan. Some things don't need to be rescanned every day. Some do. So wait, if, if, if we're rescanning, then I can also see that if somebody fixed something, it is fixed. Correct, yeah. So if we see something broken today, um, we collect proof of that, and by the time we rescan, either manually or through the scheduler, um, we also collect evidence on when you fixed it, which is obviously very, very useful. Yeah, but now we need to use the real life practices, and um, we need, yeah, need some help for that. Um, because I don't know how to do that, so I would like to invite Oscar Kuro. <laughs> if he still dares. <laughs> well, actually, the joke, the actual joke is. <laughs> the actual joke is that this is a government approved picture in an actual uh, interview that I gave. But let's face it, um, with respect to what my day job is, because my night job is, yeah, well, having fun on, and doing stuff. But uh, on the day job side, my responsibility is for an entire ministry. It consists out of, uh, depending on how you count, either 11 or 25 or even more organizations. So I know what kind of things are uh, coming to me with respect to uh, how to prove that you're compliant, how to prove that you have your security in control, that you prove that your privacy controls are, if you can test them with technical means, that they are okay. Yeah, but before we do that, now that we are the three of us, um, we need to get the open cut out. Yeah, and that needs to be published. So, when did we do that? Uh, we, did it, we did that on July 1st um, at 2200 hours, and in the next morning we got a call from David Day, the, the nice guys who were before us, and <laughs> good going, and uh, we had an information di uh, disclosure. So. I dare to say open source seems to work. Yeah, so thanks to the work of them that they actually looked at the code so quickly, so fast, and found something that we've missed. It's, that's the thing that I think it's, it's what open source should be. Well, not just us. I think it speaks to you know, why we do OpenCut. Yeah. Many yeah. people have been looking at, you know, at OpenCut, um, including some companies, yep. um, and, and we all missed it. And I think this is also one of the examples, again, because we've seen all kinds of other improvements that we've uh, in the talk that we've had with Breno and, and Ron uh, in, uh, in other days, that open source can work if you actually put your mind to it and do the right steps, and then this can work again. So I, it's really appreciative. Okay, but uh, your mission is really to make Cat Holistic, MCH. Um, 
Make cat holistic. I'll, I'll slide, you know, I'll let it slide that this one is not with a K. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the goals is that we can scan all the resources that we can actually uh, get from the, the infrastructure, and if we can't, then use the agent services, uh, which is going to be a lot, because the amount of organi organizations that you had to deal with with the pandemic, that's fine, that's a lot, but the ministry itself has at least it's three... It's a bit bigger. It's a bit bigger, and I've got more suppliers even to deal with, and each of them need to be compliant, and the compliance rules and regulations will improve because of all the Yeah, and this, this thing only works if the objects are being filled, so if you've got sufficient uh, assets to add. <laughs> Discover assets, well... Uh, this is one of the things that I had to do myself in the weekends because that's the night job, is try to scan uh, the infrastructure itself and then discover, oh my gosh, we have more APIs, we have more things to do, more things to control, and everything is getting more and more. So we need to have scale in, in what we do. And this is why I think this is a cool thing that we have now, is that we have the opportunity for scaling. Yeah, and the cool thing is, if you really understand this, um, think of Log4j. What did most organizations do? They started scanning the moment the house is on fire. Collecting, you know, collecting where Log4j was even included. Um, we didn't know, I didn't know what it was. I mean, I know Java, but that's about it. Um, but we already knew where it was. Yeah, so... One of the yeah, Fridays, if I'm not mistaken, I looked at the code. Uh, kudos to the Northwave guys, because I thought that was the most readable Python implementation of scanning log4j, then it extending was. that, and then, well, telling to the guys, hey, look, I've scanned uh, 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 the entire ministry, at least from what I could get. Please help me. Uh, I need to make it into the service. Yeah. And sharing is caring. Sharing is caring. So, so, and yeah, what we also do is we also have to be open to parliament and state, look, this is what we do. And one of the important things is that we don't just keep it to ourselves, and, but also make it available for all the other ministries who have the same challenges. Well, not just ministries. I mean, and then we can go big, you know, we've, bigger. We've got our and why, at, why limit ourselves to that? Yeah, we've it's got open. our friends at CSERT. Um, who uh, are going to scan hospitals with it. So that's kind of cool. There are so many opportunities. Yeah. Well, this is basically the overview. If you want to know more, there's time for questions. We de deliberately um, left some time for questions. It, we can think, uh, we can understand if it's hard for you to think about questions. So we thought of a couple of questions um, uh, <laughs> I mean, for you. I still have questions, so <laughs> you should have questions as well. Exactly, and if uh, you don't dare to ask questions now, come to the open cat tent and ask um, questions then. Any questions? Hi, I was wondering if there's uh, uh, there are plans for an API. Yeah. Um, so the question was if we have any plans for APIs. And I'm guessing you, you mean to extract data from CAT and use it somewhere else, right? Yeah, also to configure it. Um, yeah, sure, sure. So uh, CAT is, OpenCAT is built out of various containers. Um, as you saw, you know, we have bytes, the forensic store. You can use and interact that with that. Um, if you skip the boofy part and inject data right into bytes, the normals will pick them up. Uh, you can also query bytes as well and you know, get data out of it. Um, Octopus, same story, you could add ob objects there, you can uh, query Octopus for objects at any time. Um, yeah, just as with Brani Banani, what we did is um, make a big problem, um, and that's actually what I learned from Mendel Mobach. If you have a big puzzle, make it a bunch of small puzzles. So what we did is, that's why we have all these little projects, um, so that you make it a little bit smaller. Yep. Uh, congratulations on building and releasing such an excellent tool. I have a question regarding the uh, forensics collection and the keeping data, why, why discard it. 
Do you keep PCAPs of all your scans? And if not, yes. why not? Good. <laughs> Very good Very question. good question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's on the roadmap. And yes, we have promised this. And no, we don't do it yet. So since we're running all the containers with the Boofius in there, um, is a very logical question and a very logical thing to also collect all the network traffic that is being generated. Because, you know, Nmap might just output something, but it you know, might have seen something else. It might have been collecting data. Um, and once we have that data, we could easily make normalizers to scan through that data as well. Just scan through the PCAP files and, you know, pick them apart and, and collect even more data points from there. Because oh. we might not know what we're looking for, you know, until we discover this in the future. And also have the proof on what kind of data we've actually sent out over the network per scan, or in this case, per, con per container. So, per yeah, scan. so one of the reasons we do this, uh, there's actually two main reasons why we, why we do this. We uh, want to make sure that if we scan, that we have a proof of that we actually scanned. This is something that's missing from lots and lots of um, pen, pen testing reports. Did you actually scan this? I don't know. So if, for example, you do end mapping on, on an IP address, and if it doesn't re return any IP addresses or ports, does it show up in your pen test? I'm guessing not. Um, how do you prove that you've actually scanned it? By showing that you, you, know, you have the input, you have the output, you probably have the PCAP file somewhere. Then you have actual proof uh, that you've done your work and that you didn't find anything. But if, for some unlike a reason, Nmap is broken in that version, and it skips port 22, um, I want to make sure that I have proof of you know, running that specific v version and doing my job. I have and, run yeah, Nmap. There is a very good reason for that. There was this one case um, uh, where I was involved in this incident with the city uh, with a city in the east of the Netherlands, and they got fully ransomware, and then it, there, I stumbled across this um, pen test, and it didn't say that RDP was open. But the funny thing was, when you went to Shodan, I could see that all the days of the pen test, uh, except one or two, this port actually was open. So how can that be? And this is why you want to have that proof. Excellent answer, thank you. Um, also, if you're negotiating secure connections like TLS, keep a copy of all the keys that you've negotiated. We do, yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, my question was about your CMDB. You said it was not complete enough. Is OpenCAD more complete than your CMDB? Mm, or is I it more an addition? Could be. <laughs> no, it, but, no, I would not say that at this moment, definitely not, but um, this is why we are focusing on the asset management, yeah. um, because this is what you really want, and of course, we'll draw all your inferences from that. Modern so, CMDBs have uh, extra modules to scan the network and have from actual collections of whatever agents uh, or whatever data input, you can then state, oh, look, the CMDB is not complete in these kinds of elements. But today, and, yeah, and today we got actually an offer of somebody who um, uh, who is looking in making in a bouffier uh, that connects to a CMDB. So um, yeah, this is what we want to trigger as well. Yeah, there's th there's and two ru two routes there actually. So you can use you know you can use your existing CMDB or admin panel or whatever to feed into OpenCAD, saying, hey, I have these assets, please scan them. Um, you could go the other way as well and say. Let's scan everything that we can find, and then have a business rule saying, if there's something in the open cap in Octopus in the database, which is not present in my CMDB, there's a finding, right? Something's missing in your CMDB. So you can use both ways, it's, you know, whatever you want to do with it. Um, you said you scanned log files, and is that from outwards inwards? The reason for the question is like, um, if you have normal users using the system, you log IP addresses, and then maybe the G GDPR comes into play. Uh, if you say you have them hashed, uh, uh, subscribed that this is, uh, uh, wasn't changed, how do you handle that? <laughs> We're just looking at her. We're not just you know, figuring out the answer. Um, so yes, yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> So a uh, bunch of questions in there, actually. So yes, we are currently scanning from the outside in. 
And uh, that means that we're not collecting information on clients, for example. Um, but we are working on um, having more runtimes, so internal runtimes like uh, in your network, in your VLANs, possibly even agents um, that are on your server, and collect raw files, collect forensic information, and then we can normalize that and build the graph. Once you start doing that, obviously, you, you might you know, get personal information in there, and then you obviously have to deal with that. Um, the way you do that is defined in the model. Um, and you can, we don't have it yet, but we can probably add something like encrypted models saying this has a, you know, a, a key rollover after so many months, and it you know, gets destroyed through that means. Um, at the moment, we don't use any, we don't have any objects that actually collect private information because we as the ministry don't want to do that. Nothing's stopping you, though, from creating these models and adding these boofies yourself. Yeah. And also, of course, we ha already have the namespacing that makes it possible to do internal scanning as well. And yep. we've already got a project name for that, and that is Kitten, uh, Cat on a Pie. Yeah. Small cat, Kitten. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Hello, and congratulations on this beautiful product. And, um, and my question is really, since this does look like a bunch of awesomeness, um, this is bound to take off. It means that more people want an open cat. And one day a different ministry or hospital is going to come along and says, we would like to get an open cat uh, instance. Uh, but we would like to get uh, help with that. Is there a company that can do that for me? And the question is, have you uh, given any thought about a, a hybrid commercial ecosystem around this? Because it is, the question is going to come. Um, yeah. Jan and, <laughs> Jan and I had a lot of Thursday evenings. So one of the bullet points missing on my slide is serial entrepreneur. Because um, it's so cheesy. Um, my, my mic is cancelling sometimes. But yeah, I have been thinking about this. Um, but obviously, we just want to do this within the industry first. Um, someone else is bound to you know, take the source and you know, take it, build some, some cloud platform out of this. We, don't know. we do have the name for it, though. It's CAS. Cat as a surface. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, we've, we have, in fact, done half the work already. But, uh, Breno, how much uh, introductions and stories do you tell? How much presentations do you t uh, give about uh, CUT to how many I've, people? We have done, like, dozens and dozens of uh, presentations. Per which time frame? I think we dozens? Per? No, I think we've done about 150 demonstrations uh, in the last So, so that means you months. are lighting a fire of enthusiasm. Oh, yeah. And I would very <laughs> much, and I'm speaking from, from experience, I would very much urge you to do, get but the thinking done Bert, early. But it's open, so hey, here's your commercial <laughs> option. But I must say, look, uh, open, yeah, but it's not open, look, it's on GitHub, download, clone, do what you want. No, no. It's, it's, the thing that I like about this is that it's being told. There's a story being told. There's a story behind it. Why? A philosophy. And this is also being told at each of the presentations, uh, not just to look how cool this, this tool is. No, why did we do it? And how do we do it? And this is also one of the first, well, let's face it, tries from a ministry perspective to share something that we've built for ourselves to a wider community, way beyond the scope so, of so, what we so, But This is not quite the place to hash this out, but let me, uh, I want to tell you, I'm super enthusiastic and I'm more worried you. that it will be, that it will get too hot and, and that-, <laughs> that uh, So I, I, have a, I have a theory about this. Um, if you're in, in this kind of space and you're innovating, um, what happens is, as soon as a commercial company stumbles upon something that makes money, the sales drones come in. And that could become terrible. But let us, yeah. I'm, no. I'm, I'm, I'm available for further discussions <laughs> because I, yeah. I did it once and it nearly failed. So that's Bert, why Bert, I've got a feeling that we are going to have some grappa at the Italian <laughs> embassy later. I'm looking forward to it. But, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mind you, because we have a grappa emergency. <laughs> there is a grappa emergency going on on MCH. 
There is no more grappa at the Italian embassy. What? So, tonight at 10, we will be having fun at the Open Cut Village. Yes. Because we need to, and because Jan was so kind to present the original design of her. So this is the original, 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 this is the only original one. one. My sister uh, is the designer of this. She made this, um, and we'd like to open it off for you know the good cause. Um, it's the only one in existence. So. And Niels is doing kick-ass stuff, going back and forth, delivering ambulances to the Ukraine, delivering all sorts of shit um, there that they really, really need. Can so I start bidding now? I have already made a 250 euro bid. So 250 from this gentleman here? Yeah. <laughs> Who is offering more? I'm no. offering 300. <laughs> open Cut Village. We can do that later. Yeah. <laughs> but Maybe. tonight at 10, Open Cut Village. Guys, come over, we'll have a blast together. <laughs> and stealing your mic to auction it off. Hey, I have a very uh, serious question, Ooh. and that is, uh, what is FreeCut, and how does it work? <laughs> FreeCut is stupid, because it's the cut <laughs> website made by Anne Jan, and um, I don't like it. The Let's funny go thing back. is, uh, Anne Jan presented FreeCut to us after we you know, launched the OpenCut website, and I couldn't resist and put FreeCut, uh, .nl, in OpenCut, the software. Um, <laughs> and then asked Anayan, what are these? And he's like, oh, is that still online shit? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Older than the, uh, the poster. So in that uh, case, is the relation between FreeCAD and OpenCAD comparable to the relation between FreeBSD and OpenBSD? No. <laughs> <laughs> At this moment, um, it's less politically charged. <laughs> I think it's complicated. Th that'll be the status. <laughs> okay, I have one statement and one silly question. The first statement is, I have some experience in open source st stuff and government. Uh, please listen to Bert. <laughs> please. <laughs> we, we will. Uh, so, why the Comic Sans? I'll give you the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was one slide because, to be honest, I actually find the content of the comic slide uh, kind of interesting. Yeah, the, the, the Comic Sans was basically made um, because I wanted to annoy Anne Jan, because I can. And there we have him. Hey, oh. Anne Jan, that's so good that to see case, you. In case, I still have one more question, and that is why was FreeCut released five minutes before OpenCut? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm guessing foresight. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> Thank you. I guess there are no more questions. Uh, I, I've got a question, actually. So if we want to implement um, CAT ourselves, is, is there a KitKat to help us do that? The name? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you get that with the hopefully. I try. Yeah. But, no, that, that's been really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So, uh, any last comments? And, and the auction, just to well, repeat. I, I would just want. I expected really somebody to ask the question: Is MCH 2022 uh, in control? On, but nobody us. did. Tell us. We've got a few minutes. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, far. we don't think so <laughs> because those are all the findings. But there we go. I think that's the false positives. <laughs> Unlikely. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for a very interesting talk. Thank you. <laughs>